Thank you, Ilan. I think every, every conference should invite you to the stage because you, you are saying things that all the people with the jackets cannot say and we need it as an audience. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ilan. <laughs> Great, and while we heard uh, Ilan that uh, like is not sure that uh, we can we can solve it, so uh, in a minute uh, we'll have the the next speaker, uh, who is going to be uh, uh, Jaya Balu. That she is already it's not her first time to be here in uh, in Israel and not her first time to be at the at the Cyber Week as a speaker, and she is with the um, with Rapid Seven acting as the, as the uh, chief security officer. And I would like to say that during this year, I, I think that we, we are having a, a bit more uh, female CISOs here on the, on the stage, but we are really, it's a good uh, time to encourage and to uh, uh, say that we are expecting more and more uh, uh, diversity in our industry and more uh, uh, women as well as uh, uh, other uh, um, diversity population in our industry, we need it. It is important uh, to be better and uh, to be uh, stronger together. And now, when you're ready, it's uh, my pleasure to invite Jaya Balu to the stage. Please. <clears throat> Thank you. Hi there, everybody. So I, you know, I was listening to Elon, and Elon gave you a pretty depressing view of the world, but accurate and I think like I'd like to ask you the question how do you feel how do you feel about having a potential for a secure future some of you are vendors some of you are users some of you uh, are part of the wider ecosystem you know so how do you feel I have to tell you that after listening to Elon whose answer was clearly like are we going to be safe no I have to tell you that I have to hope Yes. As a chief information security officer, I have to hope yes, because otherwise the alternative is super depressing. And the job of the CISO pretty much looks like this. Is anyone familiar with this animal? Yeah, this is the dung beetle. This is pretty much in the job description of a CISO. You pretty much have to carry a pile of shit up a hill every day. And sometimes that pile of shit, it rolls back over you, crushes you, and, you know, what do you do? You're like, all right, you dust the little shit bits off, you go again, and you try to push the thing uphill, this time backwards, okay? So this is kind of what every CISO needs to kind of get prepared to do. This is, I'm a three-time CISO, I'm allowed to make this analogy, uh, all right? You know, three different companies, and I'm telling you that it is not an easy job. But if I believed that I genuinely could not try to fix the problem, or make a dent in the problem, what's my alternative? Depression, and probably uh, later with Chris, whiskey. So, you know, to be really clear, like, I'm not trying to give you this magical thinking, this unicorn world where everything is hunky-dory, no. Because no matter what a CISO tries to do, like, let's be honest, it doesn't matter. Hackers are gonna hack. And when we try to think of why and how come, we need to examine who are those hackers? What's their motivation? Are they individual? Are they doing it for fun? Are they doing it for profit? Are they doing it for politics? It's really hard for the defenders to figure out what the actual F is going on because we know we use the same tools all over the planet. The worst and most depressing part of this for me is that now our average in terms of time to figure out that we're being hacked, that there actually is a breach, that number is improving. The improved number of time to detect is 212 days. This is improving from the previous average time to detect, which was 287 days. So we're like, it's a Pyrrhic victory. We're cheering because we went from 287 to 212. It still means we kind of suck. We are still the bloody dung beetle carrying this pile of shits and, you know, when it comes to it, when you try to look at the overall trends in trying to detect and contain a breach, that that number also, like, we've been doing this for years, okay? I'm in the cybersecurity industry for 25 years. And in 25 years, we have not made the dent that we wanted to make. 
We have the same problems we've identified 25 years ago. We keep building new technologies with old problems still stuck in them. And it's really fundamentally, it's huge asymmetry between action and reaction. This way, you know, red team always wins. All right, red team always wins, and the defenders are always on the losing side. And like the only time when we actually figure out there's a hack, I want to use the case in point of Uber, the only time we figured out, does anyone know the Uber hack? Do you guys remember the Uber hack? Cool, thank you, Elon remembers. Uh, the Uber hack was you know, revealed on the New York Times, but it was revealed because the hacker slacked everyone. Hi, uh, I announced I am a hacker, and Uber has suffered a data breach. Slack has been stolen, confident. He told everybody that he was there, thus reducing the time to detect, because he told them, woo -hoo, hello, friendly hacker, well, not so friendly, over here stealing all your shit, OK? And uh, then subsequently, you know, like the devastation was starting to reveal itself, and then we had like engineers trying to communicate with the hacker, trying to figure out how'd you get in, right? Bottom line, social engineered stuff. There was a uh, PowerShell script, isn't there always, right, which contained a, an admin name for Thycotic, which is their PAM module, which meant that the hacker basically got access to everything. Thank you very much. So it's like so terrifying. And the internet, of course, came to the rescue of Uber, which they always do, in the best way they know how. How do they do it? By making many memes. So, once the meme supply you know, was started, it became clear that this hacker was also impacting a whole bunch of other stuff. It was Rockstar Games. You guys know this, right? It was Lapsus. And of course, we know that the kid that was eventually arrested was 17, and the ringleader of Lapsus is 15. So of Uber, with millions of dollars in budget, with cybersecurity programs, with all of these professionals employed, with a bloody CISO, with all of this stuff, is defeated by a 15-year-old on a mission you know, you might wonder, like, how's that dung beetle doing today? We haven't made it easier on ourselves. We're actually making it ridiculously complex. Remember I told you we keep building new shit with old vulnerabilities built in? I don't care if we're on 5G or 6G or 7G, they're all going to be reliant on an SS7. SS7 is a secure signaling, uh, is a signaling uh, layer for mobile technologies. It was invented in 1976. And we're still using it today. 5G, 6G, any of the Gs, we're still going to be dependent on SS7. It operates on the principle that if you have access to the network, you're trusted. How many places like that do you know? I just want to ask you, you guys have access to this room. Would you drop off your kids with some other person in here just because they had access? Some of you might. It worries me. But uh, the point that I'm trying to make here is that is pretty much how our technologies, the ones that were developed in 76, that's how they work. BGP, same story, also a 70s child, right? BGP is the Border Gateway Protocol. We use it for all handover for internet traffic between autonomous zones. And like every time we use BGP, same thing. The person who screams the loudest and is on the network automatically assume they're right. You know, so we have still issues with BGP hijacking. It is too dumb for words that we still have these problems in 2023 and that we expect so much out of the overlay technologies that originate with these underlying systems. We've completely broken it to start with. So the dung beetle has no hope of success with these conditions. We make it worse by putting all this vulnerable, dumb shit on the internet and then calling it smart. Right? And that smart becomes a vector to hack everything else. It is ridiculous that we have a connected blender. I need to ask you, why the fuck do we need a connected blender? Right? What are you going to blend when you're at work, at home? OK? Please tell me. Because nowadays, it's not even possible to get a non-connected blender. Anybody use a Vitamix? Vitamix smoothies, very good, health conscious. I like that. Check out the newest range of the Vitamix. It's all connected. Why do you need a connected lawnmower powered blender in your home? I, Anyway, all right, so this. This bothers me, and the reason that it bothers me so much is because the stupid attacks are still really successful. Why the hell, in 2023, am I still dealing with DDoSes that are still effective, that are still stupid at generating both volumetric and multi-vector types of attacks that are hard to detect? Okay, we still have stupid DDoSes really successful. We still have peering parties that are transferring traffic that we know are spoofed. It's super dumb, and it's making it really hard for the dung beetle to do its job. So 
Like, I really think, also, by the way, do your random Google search. You want to find out how to DDoS anything, Google Stressor or Booter. Google will help you find you know, a really good customer-friendly oriented DDoSer that you can play like zero money for because the first 15 minutes are free because they get customer service, right? First 15 minutes are always for free. And then the pricing plans start from $2.99 a month up until $2,000 a month. Some of the volumes of these Booter Stressor services are greater than the entire internet capacities of the internet exchanges of major European countries. So a European country's internet exchange cannot handle the total throughput of one of these DDoS plans. Is that notion clear? It's not about stopping one bank. It's about stopping the country of Greece, okay? So, and the fact that these are really effective and they're being powered by your bloody blender is the thing that bothers me about DDoS. We also have started blurring the bloody lines between criminal actors. Criminal actors are no longer just criminal, they're also state-sponsored. Kim Jong is probably my favorite example of someone who decided I too can hack for profits and lulls, right? So uh, we know that it's always been about the money and we've, oh, have, let me just see, oh yeah, it's always been about the money, so the fact of the matter is that we see the rising cost of cybercrime. The cybercrime economy has been shown as to be the third greatest economy in the world. So the US, China, and then the cybercrime economy. So it br pretty much means that we're doing it for the money. We know that the average cost of a data breach is like increasing, but so is the stuff increasing per user since we had COVID. So like we're increasing the cost of stolen records, we're increasing this cost per breach and we're making it much worse. And Kim Jong, like he's reported to have made anywhere between two to three billion, two to three billion on ransomware. The blurring lines are not small blurs, they're big ass blurs, all right? And there's a ton of money that is in the mix. Just 2023, just 2023, the first couple of months, of 20, we're now still in June. There's over 500 million that's been estimated to funnel into Kim Jong's. And like, let's be honest, North Korea has a single internet connection, so he's not doing this out of North Korea. There's a whole host of Southeast Asian and other countries where this type of ransomware is coming from. So I really find this really confusing when you look at the fact that the reason that we're so screwed is because we all use the same shit everywhere. We have an interdependent supply chain, which means that when it comes to hard targets, like governments, like global threat actors looking for those hard targets, they're not looking for the easy stuff. Because we're using everything, they're trying to find really cool weapons that they can use, and we've created, therefore, a black market and a white market to go and buy these tools. They're just people who, if you pay enough money, you will get whatever you need. And I like to call this the three musketeers principle, because we do all of this shit, basically attack something that we all use for one hard target. And that one zero day will compromise all of us. iPhone vulnerabilities, you know, Mac vulnerabilities, Windows issues, the solar winds issue is a perfect example. One hard target is the target but it compromises so many other actors because of that interdependence. All for one, one for all. And that's when we need to think of equities in zero days, we need to think about what's really at stake. And you know, frankly, like I think that the best example for how we look at how to not be a vulnerable hard target is to look at what we learned from Ukraine since 2022. Their whole principle stemmed from the black energy problem that they initially had before the war ever started. The attack on their energy infrastructure taught them that they need to defend first and attack second. And that meant that they focused on critical infrastructure. They understood that standard supply chain testing over and over again was the key to success. They got this notion of rapid assessment and recovery. That's why CERT UA did such a bloody fantastic job. They totally got this nature of, you know, the engineer in New Jersey logging off from work and then beginning to participate in some anonymous campaign to attack Russia. So the participatory nature of this last cyber conflict should teach us all that we are all playing war games and that we have new combatants in the field of war that are coming in from everywhere. 
we need to get better at prioritizing important before it becomes urgent. So on this AI stuff, well, Chris will talk about more on, you know, like we've been having DARPA give like defenders an advantage since 2014. We genuinely need to be able to take this advantage and move on. One great example, like I really like it, is with Skylight Cyber, you can Google this later. You know, what they managed to do is figure out how to attack Silence, which is a security tool, by understanding how their algorithm and how their defenses worked. By doing that, I actually think that we're going to see this era where attacking AI systems is going to be the de rigueur, and that CISOs, those dung beetles, are going to want to verify any AI system that their company is dependent on. So we need to get better at looking from a defensive perspective towards every single use. Not just, woohoo, AI, it's so cool, gender development. Stop this. We need to think like security people and be skeptical, think forward, and think how to defend first, defend first, possibly by attacking. So uh, ChatGPT, by the way, I put this up there, but they did a great job. They did a really great job with their first O-Day, so we need to get better at learning from them. I believe that we need to think better about things like quantum by thinking about, you know, we're not just going to apply a layer of strong crypto. We need to fix all of the underlying stuff first and still understand what we're defending against. Um, when it turns to how, when it comes to how do we do this right, this is the sanity part for security people. We need to have security awareness. We need to have visibility and risk intelligence to prioritize those things that are important, and security capabilities to actually get the job done. I translate these for the last 10 years into a strategy and roadmap, super boring. I won't tell you the details, but you can take a snapshot and take a look. But I try to make this really clear. Every company on Earth, if we do those three things, we'll be in a good spot. When I can't find people, I make them by doing little greenhouse projects to educate our workforce. And I try to make it clear that we shouldn't be riding the security roller coaster, but we should also demonstrate value of what we're doing. I try to create metrics that matter to prove the value, the financial value that cybersecurity teams add to the bottom line of revenue retention to the board. If we don't show how much value we add, we will always be getting FTE target reductions like everyone else in the company. We need to do a better job of speaking the language of the board, which is money. We need to talk money, not technology, money. We can do this. I am optimistic. Despite all the shit of the dung beetle, I think we can. We just need to be in more of a position to demand security. We can do it. We just need to make sure that the assholes build the shit in rather than blaming us for not you know, mitigating everything, fixing everything, they should build it in. It should be there by default, and we should be able to use it without fear. No one should be able to like, look at us as a supply chain risk, and we should be able to examine our own. Frankly, it's up to us. I wish you good luck, and may the force be with you all. Thank you.